Hello, and thanks for stopping by. I don't know about you, but I reckon it's high time we explored another set of London's pubs. The ones we'll be visiting in this episode all lie within the capital's oldest area, the historic Square Mile. And there are two in particular, which by far have been the most requested by viewers since I began this series. So without any further ado, let's go and see what we can find. For those who are unfamiliar with it, the Old Mitre is, arguably, one of the trickiest pubs to find in London, for it lies burrowed away in the middle of Ely Court, a discreet alley which runs between Ely Place and the Hatton Garden Jewellery Quarter. Ely Court and Ely Place take their names from Ely in Cambridgeshire, the reason being that, for nearly 500 years, between 1290 and 1772, this area was home to a palace owned by the Bishops of Ely, a complex which they used as their Grand London residence. As such, this patch of land, in a manner similar to a diplomatic embassy, was considered to be part of Cambridgeshire itself. In 1531, Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon attended a lavish banquet here, which lasted for five days, and the palace is mentioned in Shakespeare's Richard III. When Richard says to the bishop, My lord of Ely, when I was last in Holborn, I saw good strawberries in your garden there. I do beseech you, send for some of them. Although Ely Palace has long since been swept away, one significant part remains, the beautiful St Ethelreda's Church, which, having been built in 1290, happens to be a rare survivor of the Great Fire of London. The Old Mitre pub is directly related to the history of Ely Palace, as it was first built in 1546 to specifically cater for the many servants employed by the bishops. And its name of course is a reference to the headgear worn by those men of the cloth. As it appears today, the Old Mitre dates from the 1770s, having been rebuilt when the neighbouring palace was demolished, although extensive remodelling was carried out in the 1920s and 30s. The other road flanking Ely Court, Hatton Garden, is named after Sir Christopher Hatton, who was a favourite of Queen Elizabeth I, so much so that she bypassed the Bishops of Ely in order to grant Hatton a lease of land here. A relic related to their relationship can be viewed inside the Old Mitre itself. It's this old cherry tree stump which is displayed within a custom made cabinet. It's claimed this tree was originally planted as a marker to denote the boundary between the bishop's land and the plot belonging to Christopher Hatton. And according to legend, Elizabeth I once danced around this tree with Hatton. There's no way of proving this of course, but it makes for a nice story doesn't it? In 2002, a BBC radio dramatisation of P.G. Woodhouse's Meet Mr. Malina, narrated by Richard Griffiths, was recorded on location here, and you can see the old mitre in Guy Ritchie's 2000 film Snatch, the pub being a favourite haunt of the dodgy diamond dealer Doug the Head, who was played by Mike Reed. From Doug the Head, we now move on to the old Dr. Butler's head, which, like the old mitre, isn't the easiest of places to track down. It's tucked away on Mason's Avenue, which runs between Coleman Street and Basinghall Street, just across from the Guildhall. The old Dr. Butler's head is the sole survivor of what was essentially an early pub chain, all of which were established to sell a particular type of medicinal ale. The man who developed this brew was the fellow shown on the sign, Dr. William Butler, who was something of a charlatan. Born in Ipswich in 1535, 
William Butler attended Peterhouse College, Cambridge, and after graduating, was granted a license to work as a physician, which, even by 16th century standards, was a tad strange, because he hadn't actually studied medicine. Despite being completely unqualified, Butler set up an apothecary shop in Cambridge, where records mention that he employed an old maid named Nell, who apparently was entrusted to fetch Butler home from the tavern every night, the bogus doctor having a reputation for being a very heavy drinker. Despite these flaws, the dubious quack made a name for himself in 1603, when he was called upon to treat a Cambridge clergyman who'd fallen into a deep coma after indulging in too much opium. Butler's solution was unorthodox to say the least. He had a cow slaughtered and then promptly stuffed his patient into the cow's warm belly. By some miracle, or maybe the opium was just wearing off, the clergyman came too, which must have been pretty alarming for him considering he was surrounded by squelchy cow's innards. News of this sensation reached King James I, who was so impressed, he promptly appointed Dr. Butler as a physician to his court. As such, Dr. Butler, who was now well into his 60s, moved to London, and once in the city, he continued to prescribe all manner of ludicrous cures. These included dousing plague victims in ice-cold water, throwing a man suffering from fever into the Thames, and for those suffering from epilepsy, firing a brace of pistols close to the patient's face his theory being that this would scare the seizures out of them. By this point, Dr. Butler had also concocted his own alcoholic drink, Butler's Purging Ale, which, laced with goodness knows what, he marketed as the perfect cure for gastric problems. Rather than selling this potion from an apothecary store, Butler figured it would retail better in taverns, and so he set up a chain of pubs to do just that. The old Dr. Butler's head on Mason's Avenue is the last surviving example of this early 17th century franchise. There's been a tavern here since 1610, Butler purchased it for his own use in 1616, and as you can probably guess, that incarnation was later destroyed in the Great Fire of London. As it stands today, the pub dates from the Victorian era, and no, sadly, Dr. Butler's purging ale is no longer available on tap. Located just moments away from St Paul's Cathedral, the Old London on Ludgate Hill is a pub which thousands of people, both tourists and Londoners alike, pass by every day. There's been a pub here since 1749, and prior to that, you could still pop by for a drink, as the first business based at this address was a coffee house, the London Coffee House as it was known, which opened in 1731. In the 18th century, coffee houses were popular with the city's businessmen, who'd congregate in them to conduct their various dealings, and over time, this led each establishment to become associated with a specific profession. In the case of the London Coffee House, this was publishing and copyright law, most likely because nearby St Paul's Churchyard was known for its booksellers. Despite being geared towards caffeine, beer, rum, brandy and punch were all available too at the London Coffee House, and during lengthy trials at the nearby Old Bailey, the establishment was used as the de facto hotel for accommodating juries. When the London Coffee House was transformed into a tavern, it was renamed the Old London Coffee House. Over time, the coffee part was dropped, resulting in its current title, the Old London. In more recent times, the pub underwent a brief rebranding under a rather different name, the Bell Book and Candle, which apparently are the three items used by a priest during an exorcism. The Old London Coffee House makes an appearance in Charles Dickens' novel Little Dorrit, when in chapter 3 of the first book, we're told that, on a gloomy, close and stale Sunday, Arthur Clennam sat in the window of a coffee house on Ludgate Hill, counting one of the neighbouring bells. The bell Dickens refers to was no doubt that of St Martin's Ludgate, which is sited right next door. This church is one of Sir Christopher Wren's many masterpieces. Just look at the spire, it's incredible. And inside, you can see one of St Martin's old bells on display. Who knows, maybe this was the very same one which Arthur Clennam could hear clanging. 
In the rush to admire St Paul's though, most people hurry past this church without even giving it a second glance, which is a real shame. So if you happen to be in the area, be sure to show St Martin's a bit of love. Close to the old London, on the opposite side of St Paul's Cathedral, you'll find the old Watling. This pub takes its name from the road upon which it stands, Watling Street, which was one of the most important highways in Roman Britain, a route which ran from Dover up towards London, then onto St Albans in Roxeter. It's for this reason that the pub's sign features a centurion's helmet. That said though, the Watling Street seen here, well, it isn't actually part of the old Roman road. Although much of Watling Street still survives today in a modern form, most notably as the A2 and A5 roads, its route through central London is somewhat fragmented. You can see its straight, distinctive Roman line running south of the Thames along the Old Kent Road and then north through Maida Vale and along Edgware Road, but here, in the square mile, the path has been lost. Although it's no doubt passed very close to this spot, hence this short stretch of street adopting its name. That's not to say though that the city of London's Watling Street lacks history, it's still very old indeed, and is believed to have been laid out shortly after Alfred the Great re-established the city in 886 AD. As for the pub, well that's had a long life too. There's been one here since it's at least 1663. That early embodiment of the old Watling didn't survive very long though, no prizes for guessing, it was wiped out in the Great Fire of London. In the wake of the blaze, it was one of the very first buildings to be reconstructed, this being done at the behest of Sir Christopher Wren, who, whilst preparing the ground for the rebuild of nearby St Paul's Cathedral, figured his workers would need a place where they could obtain food and drink. It's also believed that a room on the upper floor was used as an office by Wren, where plans for the mighty cathedral were drawn up and meticulously reviewed. Wren's version of the old Watling was cobbled together using second-hand ship's timbers, which were cheap and easy to obtain, and the current building, which suffered heavy damage during the Blitz, dates from around the turn of the 20th century. By the way, this wasn't the only pub Christopher Wren had built for his men. The old Watling has a cousin, the Old Bell, which stands at the eastern end of Fleet Street, and was mainly used by builders working on the beautiful St Bride's Church. What a great employer he must have been. Like the old mitre, the Blackfriar is a pub which has been requested many times by viewers, so I think it's about time we delved in. Compared to the other pubs we've seen in this video, the Blackfriar is relatively young. The first inn to appear here was built in 1875. The ground on which it stands was once the site of a medieval friary, belonging to the Dominican order known as the Blackfriars, who were so named because the friars wore black cloaks. The friary was a fair size, containing a hall, library, stables, gardens and so on. Its western edge, where the pub now stands, bordered the River Fleet, which now flows underground beneath New Bridge Street. The friary has long since vanished, it was dissolved by Henry VIII, although you can still see one tiny fragment of it. This surviving section of wall, which sits quietly by in the square known as Island Yard. Returning to the Blackfriar pub then, well as mentioned a moment ago, it's first opened in 1875. The building was designed in this distinctive wedge shape to help it slot into this small plot of land, and it's squeezed against a railway line, which now carries trains between the Blackfriars and City Thames Link stations. The tracks are so close in fact, that if you're in the pub, you'll hear, and feel, the trains frequently rumbling past. The Blackfriar as it appears today is the result of a complete rebuild, which was conducted at the start of the 20th century. 
after being acquired by a landlord named William Petit. William had plenty of cash to spend and so spared no expense in having his new business made to look as lavish as possible. The work was carried out in 1905, an era when the Art Nouveau period was at its height, and as such, that's the distinctive style in which the pub was designed. The architect was Herbert Fuller Clark. You can see another of his buildings at 40 Foley Street over in the West End, whilst the sculptor who created the many fancy reliefs and adornments was Henry Poole, an artist who, years later in World War I, would go on to develop camouflage techniques for the army. Fragments of other sculptures made by Henry are now displayed on Milford Lane, just across from St Clement Danes RAF Church. As you can see, with the Blackfriar, Herbert and Henry created not only a pub, but an absolute work of art. The detail is, to be frank, exquisite. I've been here many times over the years, but I'm always discovering new quirks, such as this friar sucking into a tasty looking pie or this pointy-eared fellow who seems to resemble Yoda from Star Wars. Along with the art reliefs, there are also various phrases dotted around for you to ponder over your pint, including wisdom is rare, silence is golden, and haste is slow. The only feature which wasn't part of Herbert and Henry's design is the prominent statue of the Blackfriar perched at the front. He's a relatively recent addition, having been added in around 1983. The Blackfriar has appeared in several films over the years, most notably the 1978 version of Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, and Morris, a 1987 film based on an Ian Forster novel. It's utterly insane to think now, but for most of the 1960s, this gorgeous pub faced the looming threat of demolition. Back then, the area around Blackfriars was seen as stagnant and in dire need of development, it's being defined by old warehouses and a huge weed-strewn bomb site, which served as a car park. In the early 60s, an underpass had been ploughed through Puddle Dock, soon after which plans were drawn up to build another wide road along the path of Carter Lane in order to relieve traffic on Ludgate Hill. It would seem it was this proposed road which posed the main threat to the pub, as it would have to be knocked down to make way for it. Even as late as 1971, the threat remained, leading the London Illustrated News to publish an article in which it was stated the loss of the Blackfriar would be nothing short of tragic. Thankfully, two people with clout stepped in. Sir John Betjeman, who was a regular at the pub and had successfully campaigned to save St Pancras Station from a similar fate, and Rain Spencer, also known as Lady Dartsmouth, Princess Diana's stepmother, who worked in politics and took a keen interest in the preservation of historical sites. Between them, Sir John Betjeman and Lady Dartmouth fought to have the Blackfriar saved, and it's thanks to them that this legendary pub remains standing, and very much popular today. So, if you get the chance to have a drink in here, be sure to raise a glass to them. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed exploring these five City of London pubs. And as always, I'd love to hear your own thoughts. Which of these taverns is your favourite? And would you risk trying a pint of Dr. Butler's Purging Ale? Please be sure to let me know in the comments. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, then I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider doing so, as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, would ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. Plus, of course, it'd be wonderful to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support my work with a tip via either my Kofi account, which I'll link below, or the YouTube thanks button, which appears as a heart icon beneath the video. Any such financial donations are, of course, greatly appreciated, and they really do help go towards creating content. Anyway, on that note, thanks again for watching, friends. Stay well, and please be sure to stay tuned.